Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, you are amazing. You are the one that keeps us. You are the one that comforts us. You are the one that hears our cries. To you we come on this day as humbly as we know how to enter a posture of praise and worship because you are amazing. We exalt your name above every name and claim at the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that you are Lord. Holy and merciful God, open our hearts and minds to hear your word proclaimed on this day. And may that word be of comfort to our worries and may it be an answer to our prayers and an encouragement through this valley. Lord, speak through your servant in a powerful way so that lives are changed by your spirit and by your amazing love. This is our prayer. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. and Jenkins Church family. What a joy it is to be in worship with you today. We invite you now to join us as we pray God's blessings will be upon this service. Let us pray. A wise and eternal God, it is because of you we've gathered here today. And we pray now that your blessings will be upon us, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our most blessed Redeemer, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. This morning, as we turn to God's word, we invite you to turn in your Bible or on your smart device to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 12, reading today from a message translation of God's holy word. For here is what the Bible says. Here is a simple rule of thumb, guide for behavior. Ask yourself, what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. Add up God's law and prophets, and this is what you get. Today, we want to focus on verse 12 of this text, a part of 12, which simply says, ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. Again, ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. With the aid of the Holy Spirit and your encouragement, I want to lift up this text and for a brief moment preach on our subject, living under restrictions. Living under restrictions. My friends, it should come as no surprise that life as we know it in the region of North Carolina and life as we know it in the great state of Mecklenburg is now under restrictions. My friends, it should come as no surprise that life and its mobility and life with its fluidity in the Queen City of the South is now under restriction. For though sunshine is plentiful and air is free, we are now forced to live under restrictions. Though the highways are clear and beltways are commuter free, none of that matters because we are living under restrictions. Your, your, your toll free sticker and your secret back road exit, though those tools still exist, it does you no good because we are living under restrictions. 
And for those who haven't heard or pretend you don't know, living under restriction means you should not go to work unless you are providing essential services for the benefit of others. Living under restriction means you should not visit friends and family if there is no urgent need. Living under restriction means you should not get closer than six feet of distance from others when you go out. It means you should not visit hospitals, nursing homes, or other residential care facilities except for limited expectations exceptions as provided by the facility. Living under restrictions means you should not gather in groups. You should stop having block parties. You should stop having community cookouts and stop tailgating, acting like a spring break on the yard. Living under restrictions, y'all, means you should stay at home, stay unexposed, only go out for essential services, stay six feet away from from others. Bottom line, it means we are to stop and cease, prevent and halt, terminate and conclude, finish and end all unnecessary travel and unwarranted touching of one another. And why, why is this new code of conduct, conduct in place? Why? Because we're simply living under restrictions. Come on, it's like Gilligan and the Skipper. No phone, no light, no motor car. Not a single luxury like Robinson Caruso is primitive as can be. Come on, say with me, living under restrictions. But now, living under restriction is nothing new for some of us, for there is somebody watching this service right now whose life is a testimony of a cycle one after another restriction. Can I get an amen right there? For we are all living under restriction of some sort or another. For you are restricted by what you eat and what you drink. Restricted by how you act at work and how you act at home. Based on economics, some folk are restricted by where they live and what they drive. Based on societal norms, you are restricted by who you love and who can openly love you. Based on age, there are restrictions on what you can rent and what you can drink and what you can smoke and where you can smoke it and when you can work and how long you can work and how much money you can earn and how many deductions you can take restrictions on weight and hair and eyesight and hearing and sugar and salt and bread and butter restrictions on makeup no makeup dating at work no dating at work restrictions on medications and applications political donations and homeowner associations simply put y'all we live in a world of rules and regulations and some folk call these restrictions but now as I have alluded to earlier some are watching today can remotely identify with the sermon title living under restrictions but then there are others whose skin has been kissed by nature's son who have a personal home page when it comes to living under restrictions for if you look at the history of the United States of America, you don't have to look far to see that living under restrictions or living by restrictive codes, black codes as they refer it to, is nothing new for persons of color and nothing new for those who have a non-European ethnicity. For in our history, but not taught in the classroom where the black codes, black codes, or were simply laws defined to limit the rights and the movement of former slaves after the Civil War. Black codes, restrictive laws designed to limit the movement of men and women whose skin had been kissed by nature's son, who also ensured availability of cheap labor after the slavery was abolished. Black codes, though the Union had victoriously given 
freedom the four million enslaved Africans, the question of freed black status was before us in the, in the South. Black codes were imposed on people whose skin was black and they could not own property. They had to work on farms or be servants, could not vote, could not be on the jury duty, could not own a firearm. Black codes, on the black codes, friends, many states required African Americans to sign a yearly labor contract and if they refuse to sign this contract or carry a piece of paper that said they abided by the black codes they could be arrested but thanks be to God that the black codes were, were, were fought against by people like Dr. Martin Luther King thanks be to God that the black codes that evolved into Jim and Jane Crow law those Jim and Jane Crow law that provided certain services to people of non-African non uh, 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 services for, for washing clothes for only white people, services that put black people in a waiting room for themselves and by themselves. Jim Crow laws, my friends, that they had a white water fountain and a colored water fountain. Jim Crow laws, my friends, were fought against by people like the Reverend Dr. Joseph Lowry, who we lost this weekend. They called him the dean of the civil rights movement. Dr. Joseph Lowry, y'all, stood up against Jim and Jane Crow laws. Dr. Lowry says, if you don't know where you come from, it's difficult to determine where you are. He, he says it's even more difficult to plan where you are going. Dr. Lowry, who walked arm in arm with Dr. King, says at, at one time he went into a restaurant in the South, and down there he says, I like to get a hamburger and a Coke, please. The waitress said, excuse me, sir, we don't serve Negroes here. He says, ma'am, I don't eat Negroes. I like a hamburger and a Coke. This was Dr. Lowry who says, if you don't know where you come from, then you won't know when you're being taken back. But, but we do remember Dr. Lowry, my friends, for it was Dr. Lowry who quoted that blues singer from back in the day who helped us understand when he says we ask you to help us work for the day when black will not be asked to get black when brown can stick around when the yellow will be mellow and when the red man can get a head man and the white will embrace what is right Dr. Lowry praying at the inauguration of President Barack Obama said it's time for us to put down these restrictive codes and live as God would have us to be hear what I'm saying to you today my friends for the Bible helps us recognize we've got to get beyond restrictive codes and you may think this does not apply to our community where we reside right now on the books of Mecklenburg County right now but not in force there are restrictive codes in communities like Marius Park and Dealworth that property cannot be owned by anyone other than the Caucasian race on the books right now not in force are laws that can that to say that and if your skin is brown of your ethnicity is non-european you could not own property right these are restrictive codes but thanks be to god god has a restrictive code that i think all of us can abide by we call it the golden rule the bible says simply ask yourself what you want people to do for you then grab the initiative and do it for them Restrictive codes, restrictive codes. Hear what the Bible says. Ask, ask yourself what you want people to do for you. Then grab the initiative and do it for them. What, what is the ultimate restrictive code? I call it the golden rule. The golden rule that simply says treat people the way you want to be treated. I got to say it again. Treat people the way you want to be treated. In the business world, in the private world, in your home and on the street, treat 
people the way you want to be treated. The golden rule simply is a moral directive that generally is phrased, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That sounds restrictive, doesn't it? Let's go a little bit deeper. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That sounds restrictive, doesn't it? Thou, thou shall not uh, have no other gods before me. That sounds restrictive, doesn't it? That thou shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That, that sounds restrictive, doesn't it? Re remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That, that sounds restrictive, uh, doesn't it? Honor thy father and thy mother. That, that sounds restrictive, doesn't it? Thou should not kill, thou should not commit adultery, thou should not steal, thou should not bear false witness or lie against thy neighbor, thou should not covet, want thy neighbor's car, thy neighbor's house, thy neighbor's job, thy neighbor's jury, thy neighbor's dog, thy neighbor's boat, that, that thou should not want what someone else have, that sounds restrictive. But, but you see, I don't want to be so fundamental, so let me break it down like a fraction and give it to you this way. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. The, the golden rule, the golden rule is the restrictive code to which I believe God is calling calling us to follow this day for for it is interpreted by most individuals it, it it is that bedrock to which how we are to live our lives you see but on the flip side of the golden rule you have to recognize there's something called the silver rule and the silver rule is a variation of the same the silver rule states do not do unto others as you would have not them do unto you. The silver rule with all of its deficiencies is, is only requiring y'all that you don't harm no others and it does not ask a person to engage in positive behavior. Let me say that again. The silver rule states do not do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The silver rule has its own deficiencies as it only requires requires an individual not to harm others, but it does not ask a person to engage in positive behavior. What's the difference between the silver rule and the golden rule? Here it is. The golden rule and the silver rule should be taken in tandem, but the golden rule emphasizes the positive duties of the individual, while the silver rule regulates negative behavior. The golden rule is said to emphasize the positive duties of behavior while the silver rule relegates negative behavior. Let me see if I can help you. Uh, the Jewish rabbi Hillel says, what is helpful to yourself, do not do to someone else, okay? But the book of Tobit in the Apocryphal teaches what thou thyself hatest to no man do, okay? Confucius taught what you do not want done to yourself, do not do to others. The, the, the silver rule, the silver rule, it, it, the golden rule again is known by, 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 by not well, it is known but it's not well practiced. This rule is not the way of salvation but it is how those who are saved are to act. I got to say that again. The golden rule, the golden rule y'all, it, it's well known uh, but it's not well practiced. This rule is the, not the way of salvation, but it is the way for those who have been saved ought to act. You see, Jesus is not just saying to refrain from doing to others what you wouldn't want done to you, but he is saying do to others what you would have them do to you. Our, our text is from the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus gives the people uh, the first part of his earthly ministry a rule to live by. This, this rule won't save you friends but if you are saved it should direct your behavior. This rule y'all it, 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 it won't, won't, won't necessarily save you from your sins but if you know God and has died through Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul 
soul and my soul, then this rule ought to determine how we behave. The conduct, y'all, will not make you a Christian, but if you are a Christian, it ought to control your conduct. Let me move quickly and give you three points and be out of here. The first is the essence of the rule. The essence of the rule summarizes the second table of the Ten Commandments. Let me explain. The first table speaks of our relationship to Almighty God and it covers the first four commandments. The second table speaks of our relationship to humankind and it covers the last six of the commandments. If we do the first table, we will do the second table. Again, if we do the first table, we will then do the second table. This rule is stated in our text does not say to treat others as they treat you. That is the philosophy of most humankind. But it does say treat others as you would have others treat you. The second a part of the text helps us see that the equity of the rule, there is an equity in the rule. It simply says, ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. This shawl is a very fair rule. It says to treat everyone the same way. It, this is a fair rule. It says there is no prejudice to be practiced. This is a fair rule. No hypocrisy from those thinking that they're better than other folk. This is a fair rule that moves away from selfishness. This rule covers a wide area of application for it applies to everyday life and every situation in life. This rule applies to your job. It applies to where you work, where you play, where you study. It applies to how you worship. This, this rule, my friend, applies to every amount of energy that you give out to other folk. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. There is no moment in time nor no purpose person in time to which this rule does not apply. Okay, let me see if I can illustrate this to you because I want you to know when you do unto others as you would have them do unto you, that means you want people to treat you the way that you treat them. That is the testimony, y'all, of the Reverend Dr. Uh, Darius Swan. Dr. Swan passed uh, the past a couple of weeks ago and, and he is significant in our history lesson as a Presbyterian minister, as a Presbyterian missionary, the China, he and his lovely bride of Sister Vera Swan, they, they, they serve the PC USA. But Dr. Swan, along with persons like Reverend Raymond Worsley, they, they were at the front lines, y'all, of the civil rights movement, taking students to protest, walking the streets for equality. But it was Dr. Swan, y'all, who filed a court case that went to the Supreme Court against the Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. You may know the story. Dr. Swan's court case, y'all, was filed on behalf of his son at six years old who was assigned to an all-black school but at six years old the rules said he could go to an integrated school. But because Charlotte Mecklenburg schools like many school systems in the South, though it, the law was to integrate schools, the action was totally different. So Dr. Swan filed the case, y'all, that went up to the Supreme Court that was that was adjudicated y'all by the late Julius Chambers and as it was argued y'all that the best way to integrate schools was by busing therefore Charlotte Mecklenburg school became an example to the country example to the world the integration could happen by force but also by choice it was because of Dr. Swan and Dr. Worsley and Dr. Counts and others like him that gave us the 
integration at Charlotte Mecklenburg schools if it had not been for the sacrifice of this Presbyterian minister if it had not been for the heavy lifting of men and women unknown but also who supported him we would not have the, the, the integration that we have as well as the elevation that we celebrate today and it begs to differ y'all why is it that sometimes people don't want to treat others the way that they are treated why is it that it takes a crisis before we reach back to help those who need help the most why is it my friends that it's taken a pandemic for us to reach out and give free lunches to everybody to give free iPads to everybody to give free internet access to everybody and I just raised the question how in the hell can you pass a two trillion dollar a stimulus packet and not guarantee free lunches for did I just say hell well, I meant it. How, how can you pass a $2 trillion stimulus package and don't guarantee free lunches for students and free computers for students just like you guarantee free bus rides for students and free books for students? You have to check yourself before you wreck yourself. You've got to treat others as you want to be treated. The third and final thing of this text I want to share with you is there is an endorsement of this rule. Where did you get that from, Reverend? Well, the Bible says simply this. This is the law and the prophets. This is the law and the prophets. Hear what I'm saying, church. When Christ spoke this rule, the New Testament did not exist. Only the Old Testament existed and was sometimes called the law of the prophets. So in essence, when he is speaking, the scripture endorses this rule. Jesus, my friend, closes out his Sermon on the Mount by sending his hearers into themselves, asking themselves the commandment, what would you have people do to you based upon how you treat other folk? Once the people determined how they wanted to be treated, they were to go out and treat others the same way. Don't miss this because the word from the Greek in the text, apoio, it's a word that means to do. Jesus is saying you need to go do. You need to be about. You need to engage. You need to become. Jesus is saying that in the moments of crisis like this, don't ask what you can get. Ask what you can do for somebody else. Jesus was teaching that his children, his followers are a reflection of his love. The church of Jesus Christ in this day and time should reflect the love of almighty God the church of Jesus Christ in this day in time must have as a mantra this golden rule to treat others as you want to be treated he was saying to them I believe as the spirit speaks to us right now if we do not want any evil to befall upon us then you got to stop acting old me mean and evil if you do not want backbiting to come to you then you can't backbite on somebody else if you don't want slander to come to you then don't you slander someone else you see what goes around comes around the law of reciprocity lets it be known whatever you sow that is what you're going to reap the golden rule my Christian friends is a restrictive rule but I believe it's also a liberating rule let me see if I can close the sermon by sharing a very interesting story with you come with me to April 26 2008 and eight for I want you to watch a softball game between Central Washington and Western Oregon. The winner of this game, friends, would go to the NCAA Division II playoffs. But what happened in the game in the second inning with the score tied zero to zero, a ball player by the name of Sarah who played for Western Oregon, y'all, she went up to the plate and she did something she had never done before. She's hit a home run over the center field a fence, hit a home run out of excitement. Sarah rounded the bases, but because she was so excited on hitting this home run, she missed first base. As she missed first base on her way to second base, she realized what she had done, and she turned around in the excitement, but also in the exact move 
movement, when she turned, she unfortunately tore her ACL. She fell to the ground. Having hit a home run, she now lay between first and second base because she failed to touch an important mark on her celebration. Don't miss that. On her way to celebrate her home run, she failed to reach back and touch a very important landmark, touch a very important, uh, 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 shall we say, uh, uh, a staple in her life. Sometimes we have to check ourselves, friends, because on our way to success, we forget the things that got us there. On our way to ascending, we forget those who helped us along the way. We said it before, be careful how you treat folk on your way up, because you might see those same people on your way down as Sarah lay on the ground, the umpires conferred and, and determined that the best thing they could do was to put a substitute runner from Western Oregon in the place of Sarah. But now if they put a substitute runner on first base for Sarah, that would cancel her home run. The coaches prepared y'all to put a substitute runner in the place of Sarah, a substitute. Sarah had done the work, but the coaches want to put a substitute. Sarah had hit the home run, but the coaches want to put somebody else in Sarah. She had done the heavy lifting. She had trained. She had studied. She had prepared herself. Come on, somebody know what I'm talking about. You were the last hired, but you were the first fired. You trained your supervisor, but now your supervisor has a job, but you sitting at home or watching Jerry Springer. Understand the Bible lets it be known that those who are the servant of all will become the first of all. As Sarah laid there and the coaches were deciding to substitute somebody for Sarah, they heard a voice, y'all, and the voice said, excuse me, would it be okay if we carried her and let her touch every bag? You see, in softball, the teammate could not touch another teammate unless they, and then they would be out. But the opposing team could also already touch the, the team that, that they were opposing and the player wouldn't be out. So here's what happened. A player by the name of Mal Mallory and Liz, y'all, they picked Sarah up and they carried Sarah, letting her touch every base, first base, second base, third base. And when they got her home, she touched home plate and turned her over to her team. Church, hear what I'm saying. Here's what these two ball players did. They were not so concerned about winning as they were about helping. Here what these two ball players did. They picked up the opponent, allowed the opponent to touch each base, not to negate her home run, not to negate the score, but they were more concerned about treating folk right, acting in a way that God called them to act, that they said, let us carry her and allow her to touch each base. Somebody looking at me this day need to hear what Mallory says because the question was why did you do this? Why did you as an opponent help your opponent touch each base? And Mallory said it this way. Honestly, it is one of those things that I would hope anyone would do for me. One of those things that I hope anyone would do for me. Don't know what you are going through in life, but I want to drop that in your spirit today. We are living under the restricted code, and that restricted code says, ask what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. Y'all, there's not much I can add to this touching story from these ball players, but, but I wanted to serve as a moment of inspiration for you to find ways in your life to look for people to whom you could help. Find ways in your life when you are not so focused on winning, but you are focused on serving. Find ways in your life when you can remember what you've done for the least of these. You've done it unto me. Here, here's what I want you to recognize because if we are true with ourselves, you can thank God that one day Christ 
came to earth for you and for me one day Christ came and gave his life and because he gave his life and the resurrection from the dead he is now helping all of us touch first base in life second base in life third base in life and eventually get home we can thank God this Sabbath day that God sent his only begotten son and God gave that promise to all of us that if we would just be faithful and trust him with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. He will help us by his grace touch the basis of our lives. Here is how we close. I just want you to remember this scripture from uh, Matthew chapter 7 uh, verse 12. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you. Then grab the initiative and do it for them. My friends, we are li living under restrictions. Eternal God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power. We thank you for the spirit of worship. And we pray, God, that the words that have been spoken will not go on deaf ears, but will indeed enlighten the heart and bring someone closer to you. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, we thank you so much for joining us. We pray God's blessings will be upon you. We thank you for being a part of a Christian community that will live under restrictions. <laughs>